So good morning. We are going to speak these days in English. So for us is a well an experiment, but we are very happy to to do it. Welcome everybody. Welcome all the students. Welcome all the lecturers and the non-teaching staff that are here uh, that came to Barcelona. I think uh, uh, well we are very happy you 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 could make it and that you are here. Uh, thanks to the Vice Chancellor Carlo Gallucci of uh, University Ramon Yui. And also, I'm talking on behalf of our Dean Paco Lopez, who couldn't make it uh, to be here. Welcome to our faculty. This is our faculty, as you see, is a small faculty, but it has like uh, around 1,000 students. Uh, among, uh, well, between graduates and postgraduates, we have more or less 1,000 students. It's a faculty that has a long tradition on social education and social work. Actually, it's a, a faculty that is very well known by its tradition on uh, social work, more than 80 years working on social work. So uh, this is a very good uh, thing for us, and the, we think that is a, a very good point. And it's also our faculty is related with Pera Tarres Foundation, that is a social entity that deals with different social services and uh, on social action. Welcome as well to Ramon Yu University. The Vice Chancellor will also speak about Ramon Yu University, but as you might know, it hosts different faculties and centers that deals with different grades and postgraduates. And that is a very special as well a university that tries to promote social values and social commitment, and uh, that uh, it has also thousands of students. And finally, welcome to Barcelona. I know uh, I don't know if it's your first time in Barcelona, uh, but I know you are very happy to be here because uh, I think you will enjoy the city, and uh, we hope to have time for you to visit the city a little bit. A place that, as we are going to discuss this day, these days, beyond the fashionable city, there is also a city full of challenges, full of uh, social action initiatives full of uh, social inequalities as we are going to discuss these days and some of these challenges that are being worsened by the crisis. This is one of the things that we would like to discuss to compare with you. How is the situation in your country? How is the situation in the cities you are coming from? What are you doing in terms of social action to deal with all these problems? And welcome and thank you then for coming. We hope that we, you will enjoy this, uh, this international week. As I told you, and also this is for the rest of the, the, the students that are here, the International Week for us is a new experiment and is a new challenge for our faculty. Uh, in the first lines, we have more than 20 lecturers coming from 11 different countries, from 11 different European countries, and also one lecturer coming from the United States. We think it's going to be a very rich experience. We hope during these five days we will be able to discuss uh, and share ideas and experiences related to social action. And, uh, well, very happy that uh, we can share with you uh, during all these uh, days. I don't know if you have this folder. I guess at least the lectures you have this folder. Just to uh, explain you very briefly what we are going to do, but as you know, today we are just uh, having this in inauguration, this opening conference that we will have later on. And also in the afternoon, the lecturers will have the possibility to visit a little bit the city. But on Tuesday, Thursday, and Friday, we are, we are going to have presentations coming from all of you. And it will be very interesting that these presentations can interact with our students. I think they are, uh, well, very happy to uh, learn from your experiences, from your uh, social action projects, and from all your different uh, research. On Wednesday, finally, we will have also a special day because we want you to bring to some of the places we are collaborating, some of the places where our students are having some practices. So we would like to bring you there to meet our social workers and social educators and to interact a little bit with them. And on Wednesday uh, afternoon, as you have in the program, we will have an academic networking. Also, you for, to have a space 
to discuss with our lecturers and to exchange ideas, projects, and so on and so forth. Well, um, just to finish, this week uh, is going to be hectic for us. We are very happy, but we have to say that we are a little bit nervous as well. And there are a lot of people that have been collaborating and helping us to make this possible, especially, uh, well, some of the lecturers, some of the students that are helping us during these days. Also, I think you have been interacting and emailing during these last weeks with uh, Ms. Ana Rodriguez, who is also the person who is making many things possible, so thanks also to her. And, well, just feel at home, enjoy this International Week, and thanks for coming. Welcome. Thank you very much. <clears throat> uh, everything is supposed to formally start at 10 o'clock, so we'll be on time. Don't worry. Although to be speaking now is Italian, I will keep it to be on time. Italians usually we are not that on time, and you know every time, but we'll do our best. You know, my role is just to introduce you to my university, and it's been a pleasure for me. Um, I'm a marketing professor, so I don't know nothing about your discipline. So I'm very sorry for that. So I'm not going to take the risk to talk about that. Uh, I know that the discipline is very good hands with you. you know? So um, let me just uh, explain that this is a very strange university very well accredited with all international accreditations you can have, uh, which is good, but at the same time very strange because this is a federation. Usually you have, uh, you found a university and then you decided to set up faculties. This worked exactly the other way around because uh, uh, in Spain, before private university were possible, already very good reputed school existed. Um, and uh, 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 when the Spanish law uh, gave the possibility to set up private universities, so then is when uh, all those schools, very well-known schools, but not uh, publicly recognized in terms of degrees, they decide to join them and to make this uh, La Molle University. And it's working out, although it's more than 25 years now, uh, you know, like, uh, you know, wedding always uh, are doubtful sometime, but it seems that they're working pretty well with some challenges, of course, to manage something like a federations or even a co-federation. Uh, I belong to a school, a business school called ESADE, and I'm a marketing professor, and uh, so that's my world, but I will try to make an effort to try to understand all the other words too. Uh, but let me give you some figures. Uh, when we talk about internalization, uh, we have uh, in Spain, on average, which also happens in Catalonia, uh, about 4% uh, international students, own students, not exchange students, I mean your own students, 4%. In our university, we're about 18,000 students. We have about 11% of uh, own international students coming uh, from more than one other country. So which make us a bit special in this sense, because uh, we still are very eager to make more international university. But uh, in other words, in terms of students, the level in percentage is not bad. It's about, I insist, 11%. Plus, about 1,000 more students on exchange coming from all over the world. In fact, uh, if I sum up all the agreements, cooperation agreements we have worldwide, it's about 440 agreements in the five continents, which is okay. Um, but uh, this is just one side of the coin. So what? It doesn't mean nothing to have so many students, so many professors, so many staff uh, from so many nationalities. What's really count is the way you think. So what we are trying to do hard, very hard, it's difficult, what we, do, we try, is to make our people open-minded, international, which is not that easy, believe me. Um, and now I would like more address my speech to the students, if you don't mind. Because, uh, you know, guys, the world, you know, it's gl global today. We like it or not. Global in many senses, the good sense, the bad sense, and so on and so forth, but it's global. So we like it or not, virtually or in, vis-a-vis, -vis, face to face, we have to deal with other culture, other way of thinking, our religions and so on and so forth. And above all, we have to work with them. We have to, to come, you know, to live with them. So uh, as a poor Italian guy I am, they've been uh, traveling all his life and uh, I had the lucky to work in more than 50 countries. Uh, I started when I was a young guy with the idea that uh, to be Italian was the best, of course. 
if you are Italian, you are so lucky to born in Italy, what well, do you want more? Because uh, by definition, we are Latin lower, because uh, we speak a complete, you know, understandable language, we have the wonderful food and so on and so forth. But when you grow up and you travel all, you know, all your time, you discover that that's not exactly true. That in other places of the world you find wonderful food, wonderful people, understandable languages, and uh, as much as my personal experience, it doesn't work that much as Latin lower. Completely failure in my case. So then you realize that something is wrong. And you found that you know you are not the best, but there are many bests in the world and many worse things in the world. That the end is just a problem of attitude of uh, open-minded attitude, I must say. And this is what I am uh, suggesting to you guys. I insist with the students. Open your mind. Be proud of your culture, where you come from, but open your mind, because it's the only way you can understand others. English is a must. You can speak an horrible English as I do and interact. But it's just a, a way to do something, but it's not the goal. The goal is to use the language, whatever language is, to understand that and to interact with others. And uh, if you open your mind, your soul, if you want, then you will be able to catch the differences, to enrich yourself with the others, and why not, to enrich the others the way you are. So the first uh, advice from my side as an old guy I am is to open your mind and be prepared to interact with uh, diversity. And then this university is eager for talent. I mean, we look for talent everywhere. That's the guy of people, the kind of people who want on board. But uh, together with the talent, we are very eager to look for very good guys. So talented guy, but also very social responsible guy. Because uh, everybody in this university probably will have the chance, the lucky, to lead us something. And when you lead us something, you need to be interacting with people again. And if you are a good leader with uh, good uh, value, also with good skills, then you can make people happy. If you're a bad leader and with no right values, let's put it this way, you can make a lot of people very, very unhappy. So it's our responsibility of university, not only to recruit talent, but to recruit good people and to educate you to become a wonderful, very good uh, citizen. Why I'm saying this? Because today, in those days, we'll have to like to discuss very important topic like his uh, childhood and adolescence. But this is something that you have to keep in mind everywhere in every business you will be uh, dealing with. And I'm sure that the experience like the ones of this week will help uh, a lot, contribute a lot in your education. I want to thank very much the professor coming from all Europe and also the US to be here with us. Uh, be patient with us, as uh, my colleague says, it's our first experience, but I hope and I am very sure that it will be the first of many, many other experiences in the year to come. I wish you all the best, and I wish you a very, very interesting human and professional week. Thank you very much. Okay, let's start our first lecture, our first uh, conference. We are very happy to have with us uh, Pau Mariclos. Uh, probably you have read something from him in one of your uh, lectures or one of your subjects during these years, because uh, he is a very well-known uh, professional and expert on childhood and adolescence in, uh, in Spain, social studies doing with, dealing with this issue. So thank you for coming. Uh, he's going to uh, explain or he is going to deal with this title, Children and Adolescents in a Europe in Crisis, Protection Against Poverty. We thought we need to start with a very broad focus, with a very broad conference, to have uh, some inputs uh, from a European perspective. Actually, when we thought in this International Week, we were thinking about which is the impact of the crisis in the different European countries, especially on childhood and adolescence. This was the main starting point, the thing that motivated us to start with this issue. And we thought that Pau, Professor Pau, could be a very good um, person to start with this very broad topic. Uh, Pau Mariclos is Professor of Sociology 
at the University of Zaragoza. He holds a PhD in sociology at the Autonomous University of Madrid, and he also holds a master's at the University of Chicago at the Center of for Advanced Studies in Social Sciences of the Juan March Institute. He was a researcher. I know, uh, probably you know the FESIC, uh, which is a very important uh, center of research of social studies in Spain between 2002 uh, 2010, sorry, and 2012. He was, also, he was also professor of the University of Barcelona between 2006 and 2010, and chief scientist researcher of the Institute of Childhood and Urban World between 2008 and 2010, where he was director of reports on social inclusion in Spain of Caixa Catalunya. I'm no uh, probably you have come across with one of these reports uh, one way or another. He's currently main researcher of a project of the national plan I plus D plus and one of the Areces Foundation and research fellow in different European projects. It belongs also to the research group on social policy and welfare states at the CESIC and the, sorry, and the CESI group analysis of inequality and new social risks. With these groups, he is doing research on poverty, children, political reforms of the welfare states, the aging profiles of beneficiaries of social policies, education and educational policies. He is author and co-author of many books and many articles and chapters in different books. I know that here you, there are students of uh, uh, Social Europe and other uh, subjects, and I'm sure uh, he has many interesting things to contribute to the, uh, well, the formation you are doing in these subjects. Pau, thank you very much for coming, and the floor is yours. Thank you very much for this nice presentation. I'm, it's really my pleasure to be to be here and to contribute to this initiative that I really think is important to bring these kind of initiatives to the Spanish university. Uh, we are very used to, to be scared when someone starts to speak English. You know, I have lectured in English uh, in the University of Barcelona and, you know, the faces of my students were really frightened the first day uh, I started with the class. And this, is, this doesn't seem the case here. People are smiling. So, so this is a good sign that I hope, um, you know, uh, will continue uh, over my presentation, okay? So, um, and I'm also really happy to hear that you might be reading some of my stuff, which, which is, is great, you know, to, um, when I have a presentation like Oscar's, you know, emphasizing that you might be reading my stuff, I, I like feel energized I, um, and hopefully I, I will be able to, to convey this, this energy that I feel about that. So my presentation is about children, adolescents in times of crisis. I will not uh, exclusively focus on crisis, uh, but uh, will pay some attention to the latest developments, but within a broader context when, where you know, these trends that I will show uh, can be understood, okay? So, so uh, the first thing that we should say here is that the fate of children have worsened over time, okay? Uh, so it improved for a, for a while, so the well-being of children, the economic well-being of children improved for a while, but improved less than the well-being of other age groups, particularly elderly uh, groups who have been benefiting from you know, developments of welfare policies to a lar much larger ex extent than children all over, you know, developed countries, not, not only in Spain. I will not focus in particularly in Spain, even when I will say some, some things at the end about, uh, about um, our country. So, so, the, 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 so over the 70s and 80s, you know, children well-being improved 
economic well-being, but to a lower extent than other groups. You know, uh, with the beginning of the crisis, um, the economic well-being of children, in, um, you know, shown in indicators like poverty rates, have worsened, have worsened to a much larger extent than than other groups, and particularly uh, the elderly. So poverty can be uh, measured at different uh, thresholds, okay? So uh, you have like a kind of moderate poverty, that, and there is a particular um, threshold, you know, based on income, like if you have like 60% of the median income, you are under 60% of the median income, uh, the household is likely to be poor, okay? It's at risk of poverty, we say. You know, if you are under 40% of the median income in a country, you are in a condition of extreme poverty. So the, 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 the closer you get to in extreme indicators of poverty and exclusion, the more likely you, you find children there, okay? So there are still high rates of poverty among other age groups, particularly elderly, but if you go like to the most extreme um, um, forms of poverty, you tend to find children, okay? So this, this um, child poverty, as I will show later, has consequences, okay? has many consequences, has particular consequences for the well-being of children, but has also like broader economic consequences. And I will emphasize these broader economic consequences but because I think they are relevant to, un to, to build new discourses, new uh, ways of framing poverty that might help, you know, uh, create broader coalitions to combat poverty, to, to fight against poverty. Okay, to join forces with other people that might be interested in uh, fighting against poverty beyond people that usually are concerned about uh, uh, poverty. So, these are trends, okay? This is an OECD graph. Uh, this was not elaborated by me. This is just an OECD uh, graph that shows you how poverty has evolved over time, okay? So you have an average at number 100, and then you have like age groups over time, showing the extent to which, to which poverty has increased or decreased, you know, since the mid 80s, okay? So you see groups where poverty has increased, okay? And groups where poverty has decreased, okay? Look at people over, over 65 and over 75, okay? In both cases, Poverty has decreased over time, okay? Still poverty is high, especially within this group. This is an average of OECD countries, of developed countries, okay? So, but in both cases, poverty has decreased to the extent that this group, people 66 to 75, have like an, a kind of poverty rate that stands on, on average, okay? In contrast, when you look at younger groups, you see that poverty increases, okay? So you see young people, and here people under uh, 18, where that have also seen poverty, uh, uh, poverty increase, okay? This, this is prior to the crisis, okay? This is a, a graph that was published by um, OECD report in, in 2008, okay? Things have worsened over time. Okay, um, and right now you have like children and uh, young people with poverty rates above um, people 65 to 75. Why do, why do these people still stand so high? You, any idea? Why people over 75 have such a high ri risk of poverty? because they are women, because many of these are widows, because the, many of the, the, these people live with non-contributory pensions that stand at very low levels, okay? So these are people, you know, you, you know that women have higher life expectancies than men, 
and this this gets reflected in poverty rates um, um, in this group. So we have high poverty rates of children all over Europe. Okay, if you look at child poverty at the 40% uh, um, percent threshold, you know, this is the blue line across Europe, you see that the blue line is always, except for one country, Malta, above the red line, okay? The red line is poverty rates among the elderly, okay? The green line is the difference, okay? So these countries are sorted out in terms of where the difference is highest. So if you go to Romania, you see that poverty rates among uh, children are much higher than poverty rates among elderly. Um, even if you look at Spain, Italy, like Southern Europe have like much higher poverty rates among um, chi uh, children than among el elderly, okay? So this, this is, so this is, these are trend, these are like figures that you can see um, over the last two or three decades, okay? But the gaps have not been so big, so wide, okay? This shows differences. Differences in 2004 and differences in 2010. So we, we here already see the beginning of the crisis, okay? Uh, so difference meaning, um, and the difference in the gap between poverty rates of, of like old people and younger people, okay? In all countries except five, the differences are now, or now in, two, in 2010, larger than in 2004. So there is an increasing gap between poverty rates of older people and children. So, why do we talk about this? Why, why should we be concerned about this? Uh, so what? Because, uh, you know, the, the, the question uh, in, you always get at uh, American universities is, so what? Why, why, why are, we, are we going to devote an hour to talk about this? Okay, I think there are three arguments to be concerned about uh, child poverty, okay? And I summarize the, the arguments. They, these are like broad arguments, okay? Within them, you can find like uh, more specific lines of argumentation, okay? So first you have an argument related to fairness and equity, okay? So children have a right to material and psychological well-being that has been in, recognized in international law. And many countries have signed you know, a convention that grants children um, this right to material and psychological uh, well-being. But beyond this juridical argument, there are social and ethical arguments that you can raise. The first is the issue of individual responsibility, okay? So people tend to accept poverty if it affects people who deserve it. You see it all over the the world, you know, that, um, um, you know, people are more willing to tolerate poverty if, you know, the poor people can be blamed for something they did and brought them to poverty, okay? So, but nobody can claim that children deserve poverty. Being born in a poor household is random. It's unrelated to the behavior of the children. It might be related to the behavior of their parents, okay? If, if they dry, drink too much or if they, um, you know, if they don't save. Um, but children, children, you know, being born in a household is like a, a lottery, you know? You cannot do anything about it, but it's a lottery that shapes your life, that basically, um, you know, brings you into a life course that is difficult to change, okay? So children, from a, you know, ethical standpoint, cannot be, um, you know, blamed for the poverty that they, they experience, okay? There is a second argument that has to do, that is somehow related to this 
fairness and equity argument is the right to, uh, to enjoy equal opportunities in life. Okay? So many people accept, or most people have accept, that all citizens have a right to enjoy equal opportunities in, in, right, in life. But this right is compromised if you are poor uh, in childhood. So children in poverty are more likely to drop out uh, early in school, have fewer schooling years, have a, a higher risk of pregnancy or a higher risk of pregnancy in adolescence, face difficulties in the transition from school to work, experience uh, unemployment and spells, you know, um, are even more likely to run into troubles with the police and to, to be arrested or serve time in prison. Um, um, over, over, you know, this transition to adulthood. So there, there are data, you know, there are quality data that show, uh, the high quality data that show this, but not so much in Europe. The, the, we are starting to collect the data about this in Europe, and I have published a, a few things on that, but the best data you have is in the United States, okay? In the United States, children have been followed over time, you know, as they grow up. Okay, and right now there are studies that began in the 70s, and right now you have adults that have been interviewed periodically over time. And you, you know how these children grew up and what are the outcomes of the conditions they experience as children. Okay, and here you have uh, some examples that show the extent to which um, income below the official U.S. poverty line le leads to fewer completed schooling years, fewer uh, lower earnings, lower time at work, so being longer unemployment spells, you know, a higher likelihood of being on food stamps. Food stamps is like, for those not familiar with the social policy programs in the United States. Food stamps is a, a program that grants, you know, people, low-income people the right to buy um, food, to buy basic food staples, okay? People are more likely to suffer poor health when they are adults. People are more likely to have to, 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 to have run into troubles with the uh, police and uh, to, to, to have been arrested. And it is more likely that they um, um, had a pregnancy out of marriage, out of wedlock, and uh, had children before getting, get, getting married, okay? And these are conditions that basically, you know, lead to worse outcomes over life and might even lead to a lower life expectancy. There, are, there, are, there is research showing the extent to which child poverty Controlling for other factors that might, you know, happen to you over life, or the episodes, or the processes you might you might uh, be involved with, child poverty in itself has effects on life uh, life expectancy. Okay. So the second broad argument is an argument about social cohesion. Okay. So the argument is that. Combating poverty, fighting against poverty, is key to, prom to promote social cohesion. It helps prevent youth unrest and social conflict. Poor children are more likely to get involved in deviant behavior, in antisocial behavior, to the extent that, you know, um, Gordon Brown, like the Prime Minister of, of Britain, um, you know, who was like, deeply committed to co combat poverty, and we will see some figures later, um, you know, uh, said at some point that tackling child poverty is the best anti-drugs, anti-crime, anti-deprivation policy for our country. So major cities in Europe, like Paris, London, Stockholm, have seen episodes of youth revolt in the last five, ten years, okay? You, you might remember the banlieues, you might rem remember you know, uh, unrest, youth unrest in, in, in London. Um, well, you know, an increasing number of scholars and politicians are coming to the conclusion that combating child poverty might help prevent 
marginalization of excluded groups, um, and the, dis the, the reproduction of disadvantage across generations. Okay, so the, this is a second argument that um, you know has often been given to you know increase investments in uh, fighting um, child poverty. Okay, but I want, want to insist in the third argument because many of us, you know, might agree with the two first arguments, you know. Um, you know, when I give talks like this, you know, most of the audience, you know, buy these two arguments, okay. But many of the, of the people that, that might hear uh, this kind of argument, might listen to this kind of arguments, usually don't think about the third argument. The third argument is an argument about efficiency and competitiveness, okay. You know, we are social workers, we are sociologists, we don't talk about efficiency and competitiveness. Uh, we, we talk about social cohesion, about uh, fairness, about equity, okay? But there is a strong argument to emphasize um, the importance of investment in childhood to, to achieve efficiency and competitiveness, okay? So, a workforce with little preparation and limited educational aspiration hurts the productivity of a, of a country. The ability to compete in the, um, in the economy of knowledge, in the global economy, okay? And compromises the horizons of long-term growth, okay? So we know that we need an, a productive workforce to compete in the global economy. And a key to, to achieve or to attain a, a economic uh, competitiveness and a productive workforce is to have a children that do not experience um, poverty spells. Because we have seen that, that um, child poverty is related to fewer years of schooling, is related to um, a higher likelihood of dropout, and is related to difficulties in the transition from work to school, okay? So having child poverty is usually associated, and there are statistical associations showing that, with a less productive workforce, okay? So, but this goes, the costs of having child poverty go beyond that. So the costs are accumulated through life because these young people have higher risk of, you know, having problems of addiction, having health problems, um, a higher risk of being arrested, um, of, of, of engaging, of being involved in criminal activity. And all these phenomena have economic costs, okay? We devote budgets we devote part of our public budgets to combat criminal activity. We devote part of uh, our economic, uh, of, of our public budgets to address issues of addiction, to address issue, health issues related to early pregnancies, and so on. So we are basically incurring in costs that we could avoid by combating child poverty, by preventing uh, child poverty from happening. Okay, so a considerable body of uh, academic literature has established that various forms of social misery, unemployment, poor health, divorce, even imprisonment, are related to situations of adversity experienced during childhood, okay? So, and this, the aggregation of these experiences has high economic costs. In fact, in the we don't have data, we have some data in, in Britain, but we don't have like accurate data in, in, in Europe. But in, in the US, it has been estimated that child poverty has like this kind of deferred costs that amount to close to 4% of the GDP, close to 4% of the wealth of the country, okay, are related to costs produced by child poverty, okay. So 1.3% corresponds to cost caused by this lower productivity, okay, by, by a workforce that is 
less educated, less talented, okay? 1.3% can be attributed to increases in, in criminal activity and costs in security that the states uh, engage. And you, you might imagine that in the United States where you know, child poverty is very high, uh, security costs are also very high. 1.2% is related to health spending, to increases in health spending, and basically uh, a general deterioration of the health of the population. Okay, so child poverty has costs, costs that to a great extent can be prevented through social policy. One of the key tools to prevent uh, poverty among children, not the only one, okay, um, is transfers, monetary transfers, okay. So, you know, um, basically children or families with children getting, you know, a down payment, um, you know, sometimes universal down payment to all children, sometimes a targeted down payment to children uh, experiencing uh, risk of poverty, okay? And some co countries reduce market poverty to a great extent through this kind of transfer. So when I say market poverty, I say, I basically refer to poverty before these transfers, okay? So poverty as a result of, um, you know, the money that, the, the salaries, the wages that people get through the market, okay? So if you look at these countries, you see that there, there are countries where the blue column is very high, meaning that there is a lot of market poverty among children. So if you look, for instance, at Ireland or, or, or the United Kingdom, I'm sorry this is in Catalan, I, I see uh, the name of the, uh, the countries, but you know, on that side you have Ireland and the United Kingdom, okay? Market poverty, poverty before transfers is very high, okay? It stands close to 50%. So almost half of the children would be poor if there were not public transfers, if, if, if the state would not pay through, you know, deductions or through uh, down payments uh, to, 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 to these children, okay? But you also see that Ireland and the United Kingdom reduce a lot uh, market poverty uh, when after transfers. So the second column there, like the, the reddish, um, is a column where you see the, 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 the poverty, the final poverty, the poverty after transfers, okay? So you can see that the difference that, that you know, this, this continuous line shows um, is, is significant, okay? This difference is really huge, okay? This means that uh, transfers in, the, in Ireland and the United Kingdom are quite generous for children. Okay? These are countries that are well known. Those of you who have taken a course in social policy might know that uh, Britain and, uh, uh, and Ireland are liberal states. Okay? They, uh, they don't have a generous welfare ex state, except for children. They have a quite generous uh, welfare state for children, and we will see where uh, that comes from, okay? where that originated. On the other side, you have Greece, you have Catalonia, you have Spain on the other side, okay? So the reduction of poverty produced by transfers is very small. It's almost insignificant, okay? So the welfare state in, in Catalonia and Spain might be more generous for other age groups. In fact, it is quite generous when compared to, to Britain and and Ireland um, in other respects, okay? We have a wonderful uh, health system, we have quite good pensions, but we don't have a good welfare state for children, okay? And the reduction of, po of market poverty is, is really small, okay? Basically in Southern European countries. Because basically the assumption is that 
parents will take care of, of, of children, family will take care of children. We have like familistic societies where the expectation is that, um, you know, the state uh, is not going to take care of, uh, of poor children. Okay, so here we have the same countries located in this kind of weird graph. Um, this graph shows the extent to which countries achieve a reduction of poverty among children and a reduction of poverty among uh, elderly, okay, uh, among older people. So here we have Spain, okay, which is a country that reduces very little um, child poverty when compared, for instance, with Finland, that stands here, you know, like uh, the reduction of poverty is, is, is over 60%, okay? of the initial poverty, of the market poverty, okay? Spain is uh, below 30%. Um, and this, this in fact, is, is uh, year um, 2010, okay? But here we see the evolution that you found over, over the last years in, in, um, in, in Europe. Spain has evolved very little, from 1999 to 2010, okay? It has improved a little bit, you know, the re reduction of poverty among children through transfers, okay? So there has been a small improvement at the cost of a little decrease in the capacity to reduce uh, poverty among the elderly, okay? But there, there are countries that have uh, made a significant change. Look at the United Kingdom. This is 1999, you know? In 1998, Tony Blair comes to government, okay? Um, um, Tony Blair is elected to, uh, Prime Minister of Britain, okay? And his, one of his key messages, one of his uh, startling messages is that he will end up, he will combat poverty and he wants to eradicate poverty in one generation, okay? And he introduces a lot of new policies, a significant set of new policies to combat child poverty. And there are consequences of introducing these social policies. One of these consequences is this one. United Kingdom stands right now here, okay? So right now it reduces poverty to an to a extent that comes close to the most generous countries in Europe, the, like the Scandinavian countries that you might know have like this kind of big welfare states, cuddly welfare states that take care of people in need, okay? So the United Kingdom has traveled a long way to become a generous uh, welfare state with children. Ireland was here and right now is here. It's one of the most effective countries in reducing poverty among children right now, okay? So, here you see the troubles. So this, these are the trends, okay? This is the risk of child poverty. In Spain right now, close to 30% of the children, one out of three, are poor, okay? And this is the evolution that we had, okay? This is the evolution of Ireland and the United, uh, Ireland and the United Kingdom, okay? So this shows the extent to which policy, social policy can be effective when there is a strong commitment to introduce these policies, okay? These policies in children, you know, were f focused on transfers, but were, were also focus, focused on services, okay? So for instance, childcare services grew up sig very, very, very significantly, okay? So, this is again, Spain in 2007, before the crisis, Spain in 2012, okay? This is the reduction of poverty that we achieve through social transfers, okay? Compare it to the reduction of poverty that Spain achieved through social transfers for people 65 and over, okay? You, you might say, okay, they get pensions, and they deserve pensions because they made contributions uh, to pensions, okay? And, you know, contributions make you a deserving person. 
And since children do not make contributions, they should not get uh, um, any kind of, of aid. But if you look at this, you find countries here that reduce elderly poverty to the same extent as child poverty. Okay? So we shouldn't accept prima facie the argument that, you know, only older people deserve the help that they get. You know, there are countries that understand that child poverty is important, that combating child poverty is important to, you know, foster a more cohesive society, to foster a more competitive society, and invest as much in children as they invest in older people, even when these older people here also made contributions and, you know, might be seen as deserving um, they help, okay? So you see that children, like the reduction of poverty of children in 2012 is much lower that, than the reduction that you see in the overall population, okay? So you see a significant decrease of poverty in the overall population, but children do not get help, you know? Children are, you know, basically ignored, neglected by social policy in Spain. Even when, as you might see, the market poverty has increased significantly, leading to an increase in final poverty, in, you know, poverty after transfers. So, these are the effects, you know, that are really low, the effects of different kinds of uh, policies in the reduction of uh, child poverty in Spain, okay? I want to draw attention basically to this. You know, if we didn't have in Spain family and children allowances, so transfer for family and children, we would have 0.8 more in addition to existing poverty, okay? So this is a simulation that basically subtracts, takes off the money that you get through family and children allowances, okay? So the effect is like really small. Why is it small? Because these policies are targeted at very poor groups that and are not generous at all, that are like really, really very low, okay? And these low transfers do not help people get out of poverty, okay? So the, the policy that helps more children get out of poverty is unemployment, uh, um, unemployment transfers. And the second one is pensions. So meaning that children um, are supported to a larger extent by pensions of elderly people living with them than by family and children allowances. So, two years ago, or three years ago, um, the government uh, suppressed um, allowance for children, for newborn children, okay? We had what was called the baby check, okay? The cheque bebe, okay? The baby check granted um, around 2,000 uh, euros to newborn children, okay? To families with children under age one. And it was very criticized, you know? Uh, the government got, got very criticized because it was understood, it was widely understood among the, the, the you know, the political elite, the press, you know, among the wider electorate, that, you know, that this was a measure introduced to help the Socialist Party be, become re-elected in 2008. And in fact, it, somehow it was a measure that was, was somehow seeking uh, you know, gaining new supports. Okay, but it had a strong effect on poverty at, at children under one. And this is important because poverty, at chi when, when you are a child under one, has major implications for the rest of your life. Okay, being a poor child when you are under one increases risks especially a health risk, increases risk of infections, increases risk of um, being um, needing an, a hospital, spending time in a hospital and so on, that might have consequences for uh, like 
later development of children, you know, um, might have even cognitive consequences that might, uh, um, you know, might, might um, be a burden um, for your educational progress. Okay. So this was like the only measure that was having like a significant effect on child poverty, but it was eliminated. So one of the one of the um, major processes that you have found in, in, in the reaction of governments to the crisis is that the first policies that were cut were related to children, okay? There have been huge re uh, um, uh, cuts in policies um, on childcare, in policies on transfers for families, here in Catalonia particularly, there was a, a huge cut in uh, policies for family and children. There have been huge cuts in social assistance transfers that have, have an impact on, on uh, child poverty. Um, here at, I will consider two measures that have a, a consequences on child poverty. This is also the result of a simulation. This is child poverty rate. This was 2010. Right now is, is three points higher than this. And this is child poverty rate of, of a household where the mother doesn't work. Okay? So one of the conditions that helps more to prevent poverty is being in a two earner household. So in a household where both mother and father work. Okay? When this is not the case, poverty is 41%. So we simulated what would happen if, you know, in households where mothers do not work, they would join the labor force and would get a job basically that fits into the educational um, credentials, okay? So basically they, they would get a job that pays a salary that somehow is is related to your educational credentials, okay? And we we found that poverty decreases significantly, okay? Uh, both if if the poverty rate, um, uh, if if the poverty rate is shaped by by a working mother that that works part time or full time, so meaning that one of the initiatives that is more effective in increasing in in decreasing child poverty is uh, encouraging uh, parents to work both of them, okay? And this can only be achieved if, you know, social services that grant or that guarantee cons the conciliation of family life and, uh, and work are somehow enforced, okay? So one of the measures that was introduced by, by Britain in this period from 1999 to 2010 was, you know, childcare for families with, with children under three. And that had a huge effect on, in the reduction of poverty. So this might be one of the keys in explaining this, okay? So participation of women in the labor force is, is a key element in reducing child poverty. The second policy that uh, has an effect is um, enforcing payments of non-custodial parents on um, when in, in cases of single parenthood households. Okay? So we have very high uh, risk of poverty among households um, that are headed by usually a mother, a mother, a single mother. Okay? Um, and this, this poverty rate is, is really high, you know, it comes close to 50% in Spain, okay? We see if we enforce payments of these non-custodial parents, these non-resident parents, parents that do not live with, with the, with the uh, child, um, the, the, the effect of poverty decreases quite significantly, okay? And this means you know, enforcing these payments is sometimes difficult. You know, parents might be gone, you know, uh, might be unrelated to the family. And, you know, here in Spain, close to 
uh, half of the uh, of the fathers do not pay. Okay, do not pay anything for the, the children. Okay, so and sometimes and and there are policies. In fact, Catalonia tried to uh, um, uh, implement one of these policies, but then the crisis came, and you know they forgot about it. Um, uh, of paying, of of covering these costs, Be, and then you know requiring or requesting or bringing the the father to trial to enforce this pay, payment, but basically taking on the burden before you know the uh, mothers uh, um, you know suffer the consequences of not getting this money. Okay, so there are there are many options to bring child poverty down, okay? And, is, and basically it is a question of commitment, of political commitment to enforce policies that can, can achieve this, this, this reduction, okay? So we shouldn't assume, as it is often done here in, in Spain at least, that child poverty is there and no much can be done about it except, you know, uh, wait for a better economic cycle to see how this, uh, how people are going to join the labor force, force, and this is like going to bring uh, new resources to to um, house, uh, households with uh, facing these problems of poverty. Okay, you can go beyond that. You can create services that encourage people to to work. You can create universal transfers uh, that um, bring poverty down significantly, and you can enforce payments of non-custodian uh, parents, okay? So we shouldn't accept the message that there is nothing that can be done about it, okay? So quickly with conclusions, we, we have talked about this. Uh, children are suffered, uh, suffering the brunt of the economic crisis in many countries. Uh, so this is not only an issue that you find in Southern European countries, but some countries have reacted and others have not reacted to that. To that. Um, this challenges long-term uh, growth of these economies because of the impact of child poverty on productivity, because of the impact on, on health costs, because of uh, the impact on, on the cost related to security. Um, reform must take into consideration policies targeted at children as a social investment with positive returns in the future. Okay? So we should emphasize the third argument. Why? Because the people that believe in the two first arguments, you know, already know each other. You know, they, they, they are all convinced about uh, the virtues of investing in children. But, you know, we, we need to, to, um, to convince people that, you know, have colder hearts, okay? Have colder souls. You know, people that, that are not motivated to help children uh, by itself, okay? Children that basically um, think that, you know, the only reason to help children would be um, to promote growth, economic growth, okay? And this is, this, is, this is basically considerations that governments are making all the time, okay? It is very difficult to convince politicians if you come uh, with arguments that emphasize only you know, um, how poor children cannot be blamed for their poverty, okay? We need to go beyond that. We need to build broader coalitions, okay? We need to bring in uh, middle classes that are much more concerned about growth than they are concerned about social cohesion, okay? So activation measures might help, so bringing people, uh, you know, bringing people to the labor force, but are not going to solve by itself poverty gaps between children and other in Spain and other European countries. More generous welfare policies are needed, okay? And more generous welfare policies are needed, and they might be needed at the expense of other welfare policies, okay? We have generous welfare uh, uh, policies targeted at other groups, okay? We have 600,000 people over 65 earning more, more than 2,000 euros a month, okay? Um, and these people usually have partners that also earn uh, to, more than 2,000 uh, euros a month, okay? So can we afford um, having so much 
uh, uh, keeping these these generous policies towards the elderly. Well, I think we can afford at the expense of uh, keeping, you know, restraints on generosity for the children. Okay, so I leave it here. Um, questions are very welcomed. Okay. Thank you very much, Pau. I think it has been a very interesting, um, fascinating conference. Now we have the floor. We have 30 minutes to discuss uh, for questions or comments, whatever you want. We have 30 minutes to discuss with our presenter, with uh, Pau Mariclos. We don't have micro, it seems, but if you speak loud, we can hear you perfectly. So go ahead. It's always very difficult to start, and it's, if it's in English, it's going to be even more difficult, but uh, don't be ashamed. Well, I, I will start. I will try to break a little bit. Um, I think the hypothesis is very interesting in the sense that you say, well, we have to convince people uh, in a context of austerity, of uh, where cats in Europe, it's the uh, current narrative, is what Germany and other countries, for instance, are uh, saying that uh, we have to do from now on. So, well, you give us some explanations how to uh, try to convince these people, but I think that in a Europe of austerity, what you claim, it's very difficult in the sense that to convince these people, it's a very uh, hard exercise. Do you think that what are the strategies to uh, you said, well, the efficiency and competitiveness uh, narrative can convince them that this has to do also with growth, with development, so this is the, the, the path. But do you have any other like uh, strategies, suggestions? How can we convince when austerity uh, policies are the, the things that are really uh, dominating the European context? Well, you know, austerity uh, um, austerity context usually means cuts, but it also means a, a opportunity to reshape welfare states. Okay, to understand that you know not everything is efficient within a welfare state. Okay, and um, usually it was Hillary Clinton I say that uh, said something like. Uh, I don't know exactly how she said it in English, but the, the argument was kind of do never um, uh, do never um, forget to take the opportunity to use a crisis to reform. Okay, so um, and sometimes you know basically uh, our crisis you know, open windows for reform and open windows to rethink welfare state and rethink, um, you know, um, policies that might not be working, that might not be bringing, you know, well-being to people that need well-being, that basically show new needs that are, have not been covered so far. And this is somehow entering the, the, the debate when there is a crisis. You know, when there is no crisis, you know, uh, people basically take for granted the, the welfare states, okay? And, um, and you know, basically the big concern right now is how are we going to get out of the crisis being competitive, being competitive against, you know, countries across, you know, in a global economy, you know, where, you know, these emerging economies are, um, you know, challenging the leading role that Europe or the Western world had so far, okay? So we need new narratives that somehow can um, sustain um, policies that, you know, build into this, this uh, new context, okay? And in fact, the interesting thing is that 
you know, ho countries that have really made a commitment to uh, investment in children um, have proven that this is a sustainable commitment. So, for instance, um, Scandinavian countries adopted these policies in the 70s, and nobody has ever uh, questioned that they have, they have been very important in, you know, bringing uh, these Scandinavian countries to high levels of productivity, uh, high value added uh, industries and so on. So um, nobody has questioned, even in periods of crisis, that these policies were necessary to keep uh, Scandinavian uh, countries in this position of, this leading position in the global economy, a eh? leading position as, as exporting countries, as countries of innovation. So Finland, Sweden are countries that, you know, have generous policies for children and are leading the rankings of innovation in the world, okay? Even Britain, um, who has, uh, which is a country that, you know, adopted these policies in the 19th, in the late 90s, early 2000s, with labor governments, you know, is right now facing a severe crisis, you know, the crisis in Britain has been uh, in significant, with a conservative government that has introduced many cuts, you know, except for children policies, okay? So, uh, it seems that politically they are sustainable, uh, you know, at the, when, you know, people become aware of uh, politicians and citizens become aware that they work and they have significant effects. The problem with that is that is the introduction of these policies, which require, you know, an initial commitment, which is basically or largely an ideological commitment. And, um, and for that you need governments that understand uh, the extent to which these policies are effective and are sustainable across time. Thank you. Now let's have questions, comments. Our guest lecturers. There's a couple of them, one here, another here. Probably already answered. You can introduce yourself, ah, where you're yeah. coming, your name, and. I am Jeroen. I'm from Holland. I'm a lecturer at the University of Utrecht of Applied Sciences. And tomorrow and on Thursday, I will um, give some lectures about the solution focused approach. But first, my question. Um, probably already answered the question, but I was um, interested in uh, what made Finland so successful, successful in. Um, uh, in its numbers of bringing down the poverty among children, and I'm especially interested in what, um, how important was the educational system, reform the educational system, to make, to give children more opportunities to become more successful. You're asking about Finland? Finland, yeah. What can we learn <coughs> from Finland, and especially about the educational system? You know, I. <laughs> I must say that I'm not expert at, uh, an expert on every country that you, mm -hmm. you, you find in the graph, okay? So and I, 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 don't, example. I don't know much about Finland, in fact. Okay. I know, uh, so um, Finland is one of the Scandinavian countries that introduced all these measures in the 70s and, and the 80s, okay? And uh, so basically we are talking about countries that, you know, have uh, enforced these policies for a long time, okay? So the progress might have been slower than, for instance, Britain. Okay, we see that Britain has traveled a long path only in 10 years. Okay, and Finland probably has traveled this, this path in 30, 40 years. Okay, so education. The education system, th there is a strong commitment to education, you know, as part of a larger commitment to social policy for children. Okay, because in fact, education is not, in Finland, is not only education or like school education, okay? Um, so you have in Finland like broader programs surrounding, you know, school pro, uh, like sc school activity, okay? Larger programs basically of support for families 
where children may fa face experiences of poverty that might have that might become a burden for for the educational progress so uh, when s school finishes at three uh, you might have social workers you know helping out families that m might not be able to provide you know food to, to their children might assist families or might uh, help families uh, with homework for for these children okay so uh, basically, the key for success of, of the educational system in, in Finland has to do with, you know, yes, hiring good professors, uh, hiring good teachers, you know, selecting the best teachers. But beyond that, you have, you have support for families. You have social programs targeted at, the, at, at these groups. You know, in Finland, you know, it's, it's like easy to say, you know, Finland has this wonderful um, scores in PISA, okay? They have like this high scores in PISA. No, no longer that good, but you know, like much better than most of the European countries, okay? Um, and Spain, for instance, has you know um, a, a score below average, okay? But Finland has like a seven percent uh, child poverty, and Spain has a twenty-eight percent child poverty. It's much easier to get good educational outcomes when you have a population where poverty is not an issue. Mm. And that is something that Finland achieved, you know, some years ago. In fact, there is, a, there is a current debate about what's happening in Sweden. Sweden is going down right now in, in, in PISA scores, okay? And one of the explanations might be the increase in inequality and poverty in, in Sweden. As, as you know, uh, for the last 10, 15 years, uh, Sweden has undergone a process of, you know, reviewing, like, like reshaping the welfare, uh, well, welfare provision, okay? And this is having consequences. Uh, the process consequences. towards more liberalization. Yeah, liberalization. Yeah. And this is being, ch this is having consequences on educational outcomes as well. Mm -hmm. So Britain, for instance, has like, really bad outcomes, uh, educational outcomes. Okay. Thank you. <coughs> Jens Clausen, uh, University of Applied Sciences in Freiburg, Germany. Uh, I will have a lecture on Thursday and Friday. Uh, my two questions, uh, the first question, um, children have no uh, pressure groups. Children are not organized in pressure groups, especially children under three years, I guess. Um, what kind of pressure groups do you have in Spain to uh, bring forward this issue uh, on the politics? Uh, it can't only be the social workers on their own. There must be some kind of organized pressure, is my first question. The second question, um, children poverty has an impact on uh, physical and emotional development and as we uh, mentioned in Germany that uh, most of our scholars in special education uh, schools uh, for children with learning disabilities come from poor families. So is there any research on this uh, topic, uh, poverty, children's poverty and learning disabilities, which is a as you mentioned, also a question for the development of the children and the future in the society. Yeah. <coughs> Concerning pressure groups, we in Spain have few pressure groups. Like we have a few advocacy groups for, for children, but um, they have largely been neglected so far. Okay. Things are changing slowly. You know, this, this issue was not in the debate till like late, uh, like 2008, 2009. You know, before that, there, there, there was no talk about child poverty. Even when we already had like the highest uh, um, poverty rates in, in, in Europe, or we were among the, the countries with the highest poverty rate. But we used to think in Spain that poor people are old. Okay, and this was traditionally the case. Okay, but and we have spent 
a great effort in improving the, the condition of older people. Okay, so resources uh, like a huge amount of resources have been devoted in the 90s, in the early 2000s, to improve pensions, um, largely like pensions of low income people, like like the lower pensions, the non-contributory uh, pensions. Okay, and as a result of that, poverty among the elderly has come down. Okay, but the elderly group are a strong electorate, uh, electoral group. Okay, so. In fact, I have some research about voting um, that shows the extent to which, you know, older people have in mind a single issue, their pensions, their pensions and the, 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 the health system, okay? If they understand that the government did not perform well in this area, if they understand that the government was not, you know, paying enough attention to pensions, they basically vote against the government, okay? I have a paper about this that shows that they are like kind of, you might call them egoistic voters, okay? They are concerned about, you know, social programs that um, benefit them directly. Younger people are not so much concerned about programs that help them uh, directly, okay? They are what, what is called sociotropic uh, voters. They, they are concerned about programs that might benefit them, you know, housing, um, family policies, okay, um, unemployment policies, but they are also concerned about the health system and, and about the, the, the pensions. At some point, they will be pensioners and they want to have pensions there, okay? So, younger people are sociotropic voters. Uh, older people are um, egoistic voters. What is, a what is a, the political elite going to do about that? Well, the political elite basically will a bet will will put the money where they think they can get voters if they put the money on the health system and the pensions they get a vote from older people and they get a vote of younger people that are also concerned about about pensions and and, and the health system if they put the money on education and um, housing and family policies they, they, they are going to have like 20% of the population, like people or older than 65, not only 20% of the population, people um, above 50, above 55, start to be prim primarily concerned about their pensions about, and about their health. And if they feel that the government is not paying enough attention to their to the, the, the pensions and the health system, you know, they are going to vote against the, 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 the government, okay? So there is a bias in representative democracies, especially as these representative democracies are aging, that goes against, you know, policies for the young. But in this case, policies for families with children, okay? And, and this might, might be an issue that is growing in importance as, you know, the population is aging. And, you know, the media, median voter that was in Spain 36, 10 years ago, is growing older. Right now, the median voter is 42. And 20 years from now, it will be 40, 54, the median voter. And, you know, um, uh, political science researchers know very well that government are very sensitive to what the median vote, voter wants, okay? So, this concerning the first question about uh, pressure group. The second question, you know, <coughs> there is a lot of research about the consequences of poverty for, uh, on learning, okay? And these consequences, um, you know, go even beyond being a children. There is a research, for instance, showing that uh, pregnancy in poverty might have consequ uh, learning consequences. So a, a pregnant woman that are, are poor are more likely to feel stressed, are more likely to um, not have proper oversight, medical oversight, okay? Might, my, my, you know, uh, not get proper attention when the days before the, the giving birth and so on. And this might have consequences. So, for instance, there is a statistical association between, you know, pregnancy and poverty and the likelihood 
of uh, low weight um, low, low weight birth so so a low, low weight baby so babies that are low weight probably many of you have been low weight okay it's usually not a problem but the likelihood of suffering health problems during the first year is much higher okay and these health problems have sometimes have cognitive consequences in terms of not not allowing you know like the a proper development of your neural system okay that might you know um be rest restrict your capacity to learn okay so poverty has many indirect ways of affecting uh, learning capacity and you know there is a strong association of ch uh, between child poverty and for instance early dropouts early dropouts in adolescence okay and and these early dropouts are basic are largely an effect of uh, trajectories in the educational system that were but not only short before the dropout not only when they are 10 or 12 or 13 but they, they there were already learning difficulties when they were six five before they entered the the, the, even before they enter the school. There is a research showing that the cognitive gaps that, uh, bet, uh, between children are already uh, wide when they are five and enter the, the compulsory school system. Okay? So, and this is related to difficulties that they might have experienced um, in the first years of life. Questions or comments? There is one here, another one here. If you don't mind, we give the the word. <coughs> and please introduce yourself. Okay. Are you not? Someone else over there? Okay. Uh, thank you for your lecture. Okay, <laughs> sorry. My name is Inge Danielsen from Denmark. Uh, I think out from your speech that it's very important that we have high women's employment. I think that's where we really can see some differences. Also because if you have this and you have very good children's services, you have very high support for the welfare state. At least this is the case in Denmark. There is this professor here in the University of Autonomy, the Danish sociologist, I forgot his name. Yeah, yeah. And he's, I think he's shown very well also in relation to elderly. Then if we have very good services, uh, high quality inclusion, you will have a very high support to the welfare state. So it's in fact not a question. But I was thinking then when you were showing before that the reduction, there would be a very high reduction of child poverty if you have women in, in uh, employment. What are you doing here in Catalonia and Spain in order to achieve that? Also in relation to children's services. Um. We used to do much more than we are doing right now, okay? Um, so at some point there was a political commitment in 2005, 2006, for instance, to build uh, childcare facilities. In fact, the prior government, both in Catalonia and in Spain, was strongly committed to, to, to build uh, childcare facilities and to encourage, you know, municipalities to take care of them and encourage, you know, the participation of uh, the, the enrollment of all social groups in, in child care. Because the problem right now that we have in Catalonia and in the rest of, of Spain is that we have as quite, you know, the number of enrollment, the, the, the proportion of children enrolled in, in, in child care has increased significantly. And we right now stand at 40% at almost, okay? But the problem is that, you know, the children that are enrolled right now are the children that need it less. So basically you have high income or middle income families uh, taking their children to child care where they, uh, but basically because women participate in the labor forces, okay? But low-income families are not taking their children to childcare. Low-income families, since like the women have, you know, a low earning capacity, you know, they say, okay, you know, why would I take my, 
my um, why would I take a job that is only going to pay me 400 500 euros um, if um, and and leave my my child with um, you know strange people that we don't really know what they are doing uh, with him okay so um, since there is not like a high cost of opportunity these women decide to stay at home with their children we know very well and just as been anderson has has conducted research on that that the children that might benefit more from like the cognitive stimulation that they get in childcare are children of low income families that are usually also low educated are uh, less likely to uh, stimulate children through activities like reading, like um, playing, uh, you know, uh, more sophisticated kind of of of, of games with the children, uh, and, and we know we, we have this problem right now that we are, have not been able to encourage these low-income uh, women to participate in the labor forces, and one of the reasons for that is like the high fees that. Um, families need to pay to cover part of the cost of childcare. So families might still have to pay 200 euros, 300 euros a month. That when you have a woman that earns 600 euros, you know she might end up saying, "Oh, I give up the job and um, stay with my, my my child." Okay. So high quality uh, services are key to sustain a welfare state to make people believe that. You know, it's worth having a welfare state, um, but you know, we we have like a shorter history in building you know these these services, and we, I would say that we entered the right path during the 2000s, but this came to a halt with the with the crisis. Okay, and you know our government thought out of electoral consideration, the electoral consideration that I was bringing up before, that it was much better to, you know, keep all the resources focused on, you know, policies that have broad coalitions of support, you know, health care, pensions, rather than, you know, sustaining policies that, you know, you are not going to get any credit for okay and this is one of the big issues right now there is one question and we have time for another question if uh, someone else wants to intervene or say something another one we take the two together very short ones and answer and we finish if if you consider okay okay one more question it's a more detailed one you showed us a figure about um, what happens when women uh, also work part-time instead of not working at all. I assume that you were showing this figure um, in a situation that um, the man is working full-time and a woman is, is working uh, part-time. I was wondering, has there also be, been any research conducted on what child poverty when both men and women work part-time? Can you predict something? Has this also a better effect or more effect on child poverty? We haven't, we haven't conducted, uh, we haven't used this, we have only used this simulation for these uh, scenarios, okay, so far. But uh, this is a great idea, and in fact, you know, I, I write it down and, and I will uh, also do this simulation because it's not uh, not, not that difficult. Um, you know, also interesting, emancipatory uh, question. The what? Emancipatory, Emancip emancipation, emancipation. Emancipation, yeah. yeah. A question about emancipation when men and women are both working part-time what's the, what could be the effect on uh, lowering actually. the child poverty rates yeah we, we I, I don't know I haven't conducted like the analysis but um, you know for a long time we had very low levels of part-time uh, jobs in Spain uh, this was not uh, a, an option you know unlike Holland where part-time you know became a you had Dutch, aren't you? Yes, so, yes. Yeah. Okay. Part-time. Where, where part-time is like a big issue and many uh, women and young people work uh, work part-time. In Spain, this was not an issue. 
you know, the new reform introduced by labor reform introduced by the, the Spanish government last year seems to be increasing part time, but it's non voluntary part time. Um, unlike, you know, what you have in Holland, where part time is often, you know, an option that women take to uh, save time to stay with their children, or, or even men take to save time uh, to stay with their children. In Spain, most of the part time jobs are non voluntary part time jobs. It's kind of the, the German mini jobs, okay? So jobs that you take because you have no other options. So I don't know to what extent these kind of low quality part time jobs are going to bring down poverty to the, to the same extent as, you know, higher quality part time jobs that you might find in Holland. And our last question, very short. <coughs> my name is Gwendy Munches, I'm from Belgium. Um, my question is a bit of wondering because I um, heard you say uh, when uh, there's a crisis, uh, governments choose more uh, where their um, votes go than um, to the policies themselves. I was thinking um, if it is so that uh, governments choose where their votes go to, um, where should we point our arrows? Should we point our arrows to the governments who get elected and influence them? Or influence the people who have the vote and uh, empower the people to vote where they uh, yeah, where they can? Well, I think it's very important to have people understand the importance of combating child poverty, okay? And there are many people that right now already understand that, you know, a modern country um, cannot, should not allow, you know, having children in extreme poverty out of concerns for, you know, like, um, like sentimental concern for 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 children okay this it hurts our feelings to to see children you know that live in in an inadequate housing or that uh, that are suffering because because um, um, their families cannot warm up their houses or even malnourishment this is this is an issue that came up recently in spain in catalonia Okay, there was this report showing that there were 900 children that were suffering uh, from malnourishment, okay? And this, this provoked an outcry among citizens saying, well, that, that's, that's, that cannot be tolerated in a, in, a, in a European society, okay? But this kind of outbursts of concern usually Ash, um, do not last long, okay? They, 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 they are like short uh, outcries of, there are short outcries of, you know, anger against governments, but, you know, after a few weeks, you know, um, things are calm again, you know, we are no longer concerned about uh, child poverty, okay? So this is, this is not a, sustainable way of achieving change, okay? So we sh should have broader concerns that not only convince, you know, citizens, readers of newspapers, like viewers, like TV viewers, also, um, about the, the importance of, of combating child poverty because we can, we should not allow having children you know, in these conditions. But we should have, like, built narratives that convince people that take decisions, that take decisions about, about uh, where to place the money, that it is a good investment to place the money in combating child poverty. And these people are basically in government, but these people might, be, might also be in in, in opposition parties and might be in the public administration. So these people that basically elaborate policies, that implement policies, should be um, uh, well aware of how these policies 
can grant them re-election, how these policies can uh, foster growth, and growth will be valued by everybody, okay? And this can be broadly accepted we, um, across the political space. There is no reason to think, you know, left-leaning parties can uh, are more willing to, to combat poverty. I want to convince right-wing parties that, you know, the, that there is much at stake at combating uh, um, um, child poverty. And I think there is no reason for right-wing parties to reject to um, um, combating child poverty. Um, you know, the values that implicit in this third argument are perfected, perfectly acceptable by, by a, a, a right-wing, a conservative uh, party or a, co or a conservative voter. So uh, I think our challenge right now is to bring the discourse, the narrative for combating po uh, um, child poverty beyond, you know, the groups that traditionally supported them. Thank you very much. Just give me two minutes, okay? First of all, I would like to thank uh, Pau for this very, very interesting opening conference. I think it gives us a very good framework to start these uh, next four days to discuss about all these issues. Thank you very much.